We have with us tonight alums from our institution. Uh, we have with us our expert colleagues from around the world who are in gastroenterology. Uh, we have with us uh, friends, students, fellows, folks from industry. It's really a mixed group and we're delighted that you are all here joining us. Dr. Kersner died in 2012 and the university uh, had a memorial service for him, but we recognized that many people were unable to join us for that. And we wanted to do something for our professional colleagues for a long time, and this seemed like a great opportunity. One of Dr. Kersner's longtime friends and someone whose son had been a patient of his provided us with support to endow both a fellowship position that we are now filling for the first time and an annual conference. Um, and so Nancy and Cy Taxman, who couldn't join us tonight, uh, had their family foundation endow a conference like this. So annually, uh, perhaps at different times of the year, depending on the events, we are going to hold a conference on updates in GI. It won't always be about inflammatory bowel disease, but everyone here knows that Dr. Kersner's love was the field of inflammatory bowel disease. I met Dr. Kersner when I was a first-year medical student at the University of Chicago, when my grandmother told me that I should go find him because he was her doctor and he saved her life. And so some of you have heard this story, but as a very naive medical student, I looked him up and I had no appointment scheduled and I just went and knocked on his door. And for whatever reason, his two secretaries were at lunch, I think, and he answered the door himself. And I said, Dr. Kersner, my name is David Rubin and my grandmother was your patient. Actually, I had no idea when she was his patient. Um, and she told me she has Crohn's disease and I must admit, I don't know what Crohn's disease is, but she says to say hi and thank you. And so he said, oh, come in, you know how he was. And everyone here who's ever talked to him or worked with him remembers what his office looked like. And he invited me to come in and sit next to him and uh, tell me about my grandmother, tell him about my grandmother. And he said, I remember her. And I thought he was totally lying to me, but everyone here now knows, of course, he remembered her uh, because he remembered a lot of his patients, if not most of them. Uh, and then I had the, the fortune, as many in this room did, of working with him uh, for the last parts of his life, and others here can recollect earlier times in his career. So uh, it was really an honor for all of us to know this man, uh, and there are many things that we can reflect on, but one of the things I've learned as I've, I've read his writings and what I learned when he was alive talking to me is that there were many challenges in his career in medicine. Uh, when Medicare came around, people thought that was the end of medicine as we know it. Uh, when there were changes in hospital structure and leadership, uh, there were woes and this dean needs to go and there were problems that occurred. Uh, and so he always looked at it as an opportunity to fix things or to do it differently or better. Uh, he was really a remarkable man in that way. Uh, I, I never knew him in the 22 years that I knew him to um, bemoan changes as it's the end of the world, like we hear from some of our colleagues and uh, I think that we can learn a lot from him in that regard. And there are other things we can learn too that I'm going to show you in a few slides going through his career. But when we organized tonight, um, it was the plan of my colleagues and uh, me to think about who could we invite to reflect on the field of inflammatory bowel disease. And we thought they need to be people who are recognized experts in the field, but really importantly, they needed to be people who knew Kersner and who could reflect on their relationship to him and how he influenced the field and how he influenced them. And um, I'm delighted that the first two people we uh, invited were available and um, jumped at the chance to join us tonight. So we're really honored by the presence of both uh, Professor Derek Jewell and uh, Professor Steph Targan tonight. But I re recognize that many in this room could easily also join us at the podium and tell about the field of IBD and how Kersner influenced them. But we're looking forward to hearing from them. So Kersner lived a long life um, and he was born in 1909 to parents in Boston to a family that didn't have very much. Uh, worked very hard. It was important to his mother that he go to medical school. I'm sure no Jewish boy has ever heard that. And uh, he attended Tufts and he came to the University of Chicago to do uh, internal medicine. Worked at a place called the Woodlawn Clinic and while he was there he met a patient who had an ear infection who ended up being his wife uh, later and she encouraged him to go across the street and maybe learn how to be something more than just an internist, which uh, he was interested in, but he realized that maybe he wanted to specialize. Back then, specialties really weren't the thing. No one really discussed it the way we do now. 
Um, but he walked over and he got a job at the University of Chicago. He was told, you can see patients if you want, Kersner, but we do research here. And if you don't do research, you can't stay. And they gave him some very modest salary. Um, and he started his work in infectious disease. And after a little while, he said to the guy, you know, I'm enjoying seeing patients with you, but uh, I was told I need to do research. And we haven't done any research. And he said, all that needed to be discovered has been discovered. Go back and see some more patients. So Kersner did that for a little bit and realized he's not going to last if he sticks around with this guy. So he worked his way over to Walter Palmer and then worked with Walter Palmer, who gets credit for establishing, a, I think, one of the earliest, if not the earliest, uh, academic gastroenterology units, where he then worked as Kersner's mentor. Kersner's first paper was published in 1937, and we actually found it in uh, some of his writings. This is uh, from the cover. It was on oral pollen therapy, so you can see he had a little interest in immunology, uh, even in the early days. And I was joking when I emailed this to uh, our colleague, Chuch Bernstein, that I knew Chuch was prolific, but I didn't know he was publishing even before he was born. But obviously, this was uh, an interest of Kersner's. And then he actually um, continued on, and this is from his PhD thesis, which was on alkalosis and how the kidneys responded to the SIPI diet, because his early work was in, of course, peptic ulcer disease. Uh, and we found a copy of his PhD thesis that Walter Palmer had, had bound and gave to uh, Kersner's wife with thanks, which I thought was really interesting. Kersner volunteered to serve in World War II. He wasn't drafted, um, uh, but he went on his own because he felt it was important. And he served uh, both in Normandy and in, uh, overseas in Europe, and then he went across and actually was in the Pacific region uh, and saw um, people who survived the nuclear bomb attacks. Uh, so he, for many years, talked about his experience seeing Holocaust victims and then seeing people who uh, had extreme radiation exposure, and that influenced a lot of his career. Towards the end of his life, he was reflecting on the fact that while he was over in Europe, there was a bomb that went off uh, right in his office. And he wasn't in his office that particular day. And anyone here who knew Kersner knew that he was very regimented with his schedule and everything he did. For whatever reason, that day he was not in his office, and somebody else was who died. And so he was reflecting on it throughout his career, I think. But towards the end of his life, he said, that was when I knew I better get home and do something worthwhile with the rest of my life, because I was saved for some reason. In his mid-career, um, he had some very good friends who formed what many in the room know of as the Gastrointestinal Research Foundation. These were friends of his and patients who really wanted to support his work and recognized that they could do so by raising money for research. Uh, and Kersner was very fond of his foundation, which to this day still exists and does wonderful things for the GI group. Uh, he was section chief in 1962 and then became chief of staff in the 70s. Uh, he often reflected on he was one of the first people that he knows of who banned smoking in the hospital, which was a very unpopular thing to do at that time. Um, but he was proud of that decision early when uh, they realized what smoking was doing. Uh, in 1974, he published the first edition of his um, soon-to-be well-regarded IBD textbook that many in this room are aware of. Um, and of interest, he was told that he should retire in the 1970s. And there was a letter that I found in his office when I was cleaning things out from the president of the university who said, the board has met and we've granted you three more years, Kersner. That was in 1975. Uh, he also had a distinguished um, professorship. Later in his career, he really started reflecting on the history of medicine, the history of GI. He had sort of seen it all unfold in his lifetime and felt it was important to document it. He twice won the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, he stopped seeing patients at age 95. And to the day, on his birthday at age 95, is when he stopped seeing patients. At age 92, he had called me into his office to say he was going to retire in three years. And so, in fact, that's exactly what he did. And then he submitted a three-year plan to the dean. And on his 98th birthday, he went back to the dean with a two-year plan. And then when he turned 100, he said, uh, I think I'll give him a one-year plan. Um, but he kept going. And that's probably the secret to his success. So he always had a goal. He always had a plan. He always knew that there was going to be something next. Uh, in 2006, he gave Department of Medicine grand rounds on the history of the University of Chicago Medical Center, seven decades of personal observations. And during those grand rounds, um, he delivered it like anyone would have in a spectacular fashion, standing next to the podium, the whole time delivering his lecture, ending on time, 
and it was well regarded. So the day after that Grand Rounds, he called me up and said, I want to do it again. So in 2009, he gave another Grand Rounds. This was on the history of gastroenterology. Uh, and he was very proud of those things. In fact, he was still planning another one at the time he passed away. Um, his books were then published, and the sixth edition came out late in his life, and he got to see that, uh, edited by uh, Balfour Sarder and also by Bill Sanborn. And overall, he had 750 publications and 15 books. Um, his extensive library was donated uh, to the GI section, and we built a space for it. Uh, and we've kept it, and many of his writings are now at the archives at the Regenstein Library, and they're organizing them, and they'll be available and digitized online for those who have an interest in the history of our field. He also had one of his former trainees who had an interest in history write his biography. So G.I. Joe was published um, late in his life, and he was very proud to have that project done and um, reflected on it often. So when he wrote about the history of GI, I would encourage you, if you want to learn a little bit about where we came from, because I've come to appreciate how much we can learn about where we're going by looking back a bit. Um, he's written about the history of medicine. He's written about the history of GI as a field. And he even published a book on it called The Origins and Directions of IBD. Um, that book is sitting next to me on the table here. And we're going to give one to each of our speakers tonight. Um, and we've marked the book where they're each mentioned in his book. So you'll see where you are in that book. You probably already have copies knowing Kersner. He also always went back to the concept that um, it's not all about science. It's also about caring for people. And he wrote articles like this, uh, one of his famous ones, We Are Still More Than Molecules. Um, and I found this quote when I was listening to some of his audio. The big complaint that patients have is not that we don't know enough, but that we don't care enough. And that was very, very important to him. And I think that was really the core of everything he did. If that wasn't enough, um, he claims a responsibility for founding or co-founding all of these organizations that you see here. Um, the General Medicine Study Section of the NIH is an interesting story where he had submitted a couple grants in post-World War II uh, US, um, and they were getting rejected. And he decided that something was wrong. My grants should not be rejected. So he invited someone to his office, and he realized that the people reviewing the grants were left over from the military Department of Defense grants, and they were physicists and chemists, and they knew nothing about medicine. So it was that day that they formed the General Medicine Study Section of the NIH. And um, I've tried calling people to tell them they should be accepting my grants. It doesn't work that way anymore. <laughs> he also was very instrumental in the um, National Foundation for Ileitis and Colitis, which became the CCFA and has a tight, a longstanding relationship with them, as you already heard. And we found um, many audio and some video recordings of him, but this particular one touched us and was very appropriate for tonight. Larry Brandt, one of our dear colleagues, interviewed him in 2003. Um, and at the end of the interview, uh, he actually asked him a very important question. So we're going to play that now. How would you like to be remembered? I think I'd like to be remembered as a knowledgeable and compassionate physician who believed in the unity of the art of medicine and the science of medicine on behalf of the sick person. Did you guys hear that or you want me to play it again? You can hear it okay. Very touching. And he had that very booming, distinguishing voice that everyone knows. Uh, so we've done a few things at the university to remember him properly, uh, thanks to the Taxman family uh, and many others. Um, one was to create this nice library and conference center. Um, the other was to create a, a website, which will ultimately contain his archived uh, writings and hopefully grow into more. And um, the first Kersner Fellow has been named recently, and she's our advanced IBD fellow, Britt Christensen, from Australia. And of course, this symposium. So our first speaker was actually Larry Brandt, which we thought was very nice to bring him in. He knew uh, Dr. Kersner very well in, in September and spoke uh, beautifully. And tonight, we're really honored by our two visiting speakers.